Chapter 2, Western Siberia, a land of deportation. On February 7th, 1933, the Ogpus Plenipotentiary representative in Western Siberia, Alexiev, the regional head of the political police, received a telegram signed by Heinrich Iagoda informing him of the imminent deportation between winter and summer of this year of a new contingent of one million people. This contingent was to be settled as far as possible from any railway, that is, in the northern districts, and especially in the immense forests and marshes of the Narim region, which covered almost 350,000 square kilometers. It was specified that the deportees were to work in agricultural, fishing, forestry, and that within two years, the state was to be completely freed of any need to provide supplies for this contingent. Totally forgot to record the, uh, the vid. Anyway, we're gonna continue. Here we go. Yeah, four soon, two years, completely free. Blah, blah. As for the concrete details of this vast operation, the regional Ogpu authorities were expected within two days to provide Moscow with the following information. One, the place is suitable for settling the deportees, along with the number of families that could be settled in each district. Two, the lands available and their quality. Three, potentialities for development, agriculture, fishing, craft work. Four, data regarding the number of Sovakozis, Soviet farms, considered by the local authorities to be unpromising and that, and that could be put back into production by contingents of deportees. Five, needs in cash, construction methods, and so forth that had, uh, had to be met for the settlement of the deportees. A budget for supply, transportation, farm tools, tractors, seeds, and productive livestock to get farming started. Six, how to organize a smooth transfer of individuals and merchandise. Seven, concrete proposals for using specific existing villages to house a first wave of 100,000 deportees to be carried out during the winter. Eight, manpower needs to manage the contingent, guards, police officers, etc. Nine, proposals for organizing transfers by the river or road after the rail convoys had been unloaded. 10. Availability of and needs for health personnel and medicines. 11. Needs for local means of transportation. Obviously, all these questions indicated that the grandiose plan for deportation had been improvised. Na kuda. On the spur of the moment. Away of proceeding that was not unusual in economic planning during these years. Two days later, Iagota's telegram was discussed at the highest regional political level in the office of the Party Committee of Western Siberia, led by Robert Ike, and in the presence of the Ogpu's plenipotentiary representative and two of the highest officers of the Siblog, the Siberian branch of the Gulag responsible for managing labor camps and special villages. The committee categorically rejected and the deportation plan, deeming it absolutely impossible to settle a million special settlers before the end of the river navigation season or to settle 100,000 of them during the winter. At most, the region could accept 28,000 deportees during the winter months and 250,000 to 275,000 over the whole of the year 1933. 
The committee asked Moscow to send at least 25,000 horses to Western Siberia and to see to it that the deportees arrived with at least three months' worth of supplies, as well as a minimum number of articles for daily life, farm tools, and the construction materials. It was also proposed to the head of the Siblag, Alexander Gorchkov, go immediately to Moscow to explain in detail the region's refusal to accept a million deportees. The Siberian authorities reacted to the massive dispatch of contingents of deportees to their region was not unprecedented. In August 1929, long before the first large-scale deportations of dekulakized peasants in early 1930, regional party leaders in western Siberia had vigorously protested against the increasing frequent dispatch of large groups of socially dangerous elements exiled to Siberia by the Ogpu. We already have the burden of responsibility for 6,000 exiles and 3,000 young vagabonds who are terrorizing the peaceful population of our region. And we urgently ask an immediate halt to any further dispatch of socially dangerous elements to Siberia without previous agreement on our part regarding the possibility of accepting these contingents. Similarly, in February 1930, Robert Icke, who was nonetheless a faithful Stalinist, had sought without success to negotiate a decrease in the number of dekulakized peasants whom the central authorities had planned to deport to Western Siberia. 15,000 families coming from Ukraine and from the central Black Earth region instead of 30,000. The regional authorities thought their er, the regional authorities thought their area was in serious danger of being transformed into a garbage can region, and that the expected benefits of a labor force intended to exploit natural resources would be very slight in comparison with the huge problems of policing these enormous contingents of outlaws. On February 10, 1933, Robert Icke wrote to Stalin himself, setting forth the reasons why the plan proposed by the Ogpu's leadership seemed to him totally unrealistic, and though thought up by the comrades who know nothing about the reality of the Great North. Ike emphasized that merely in order to transport during the winter months an initial contingent of 100,000 deportees to the place assigned for their residence, along with the minimum of supplies to allow them to survive until summer, would require between 30,000 and 35,000 horses, far more than existed in the Naram region, the Naram region. Such a mobilization could not fail to compromise irredeemably the plan of the agricultural production in, whole, in the whole region for years to come. By raising this point, Ike, as the highest regional party official, was making an important argument. At this time, because of the critical situation in Ukraine and the North Caucasus, the country's two great producing areas, Western Siberia, as one of the agricultural regions making large deliveries to the state, was becoming particularly strategic. In early February 1933, the 1932 plan for obligatory deliveries from Western Siberia, which would have been fulfilled by the end of the year, had still not been completed. The regional leadership had asked Moscow for a final delay until March 1st. For Ike and the regional communist leadership, a massive new influx of deportees would disrupt an already very precarious situation in this fragile eastern outpost of socialism. For the past two years, Western Siberia had in fact been confronting the four major problems. A serious agricultural crisis following the particularly difficult dekulakization of this frontier region, which had long been colonized before by enterprising peasants. A crisis that had led to significant shortages, even here and there, to famines. A flare-up of ethnic tensions due to a massive influx of Kazakhs, Kazakhs, massive influx of Kazakhs, fleeing a major famine 
that was to kill, over the course of three years, almost a third of the Kazakh population. A sharp rise in social disorder, and especially in outlawry, in this Far East area where the forces of order seemed overwhelmed. The fourth problem, which will be discussed later in greater detail, was particularly difficult for the authorities that of managing some 300,000 special settlers, chiefly peasants who had been dekulakized in 1930-31 to 31 and deported. Western Siberia, and especially the particularly inhospitable and isolated area of Naraim, received more special settlers than, other, than another other region in the USSR except the Urals. Taking into account detainees in the Siblog's labor camp, about 50,000 in early 1933, and some 150,000 special settlers, settlers who had over the past two years fled their assigned places of residence, the concentration of outlaws in western Siberia was particularly high with respect to the region's total population. More than 500,000 persons out of barely six million inhabitants, very unequally distributed over an immense territory exceeding two million square kilometers in area. Thus, settling under emergency conditions, another contingent of one million persons seemed in fact an impossible task, even to a perfect Stalinist leader like Robert Icke. Icke's name would probably have been forgotten like those of so many other victims of the purges of 1937-38, had the tortures to which he was subjected after his arrest as an enemy of the people not been discussed at length by Nikita Khrushchev in his secret report to the Soviet Communist Party's 20th Congress. Born in 1890 in a family of farm workers laboring on the great estate of the landed aristocracy on the coast of Baltic, Ike was a typical representative of the first generation of Bolsheviks. Having joined at the age of 16, when he was a blacksmith's apprentice, a small social democratic group, he rose quickly despite being arrested and forced to flee Great Britain and Holland in the Latvian Social Democratic Party's organization which was to become a seed bread, a seed bed for Bolshevik political and police officials. After the fall of the, after the fall of the emephoral Bolshevik power in Latvia, May 1919, Ike was sent as a commissar for supplies to the Urals and then to Siberia, where he displayed great revolutionary energy on the Serials front. In 1924, he was named head of the Siberian Revolution Committee, an authority that stood in for the party's regular organizations in that region that was still poorly controlled by the central power. One of the chief tasks assigned to Ike during these years of the NEP was to break NEP. Uh, one of the chief tasks uh, assigned to Ike during these years of the NEP was to break up the sales networks for the products of Siberian agriculture that were largely controlled by Nepmen and Kulaks, a mission that took on very special importance for the communist state in early 1928. Despite an excellent harvest, the products of the state, organs that were offering very low prices, Despite an excellent harvest, the peasants were grumbling about being forced to sell their, price, their products to state organs that were offering very low prices. Food supplies for cities were threatened, and exports of cereals, which were indispensable in order to purchase the industrial equipment necessary to launch the uh, first five-year plan, were compromised. In order to break what he called the Kulak Strike, Stalin personally undertook an exceptional tour of Western Siberia. In this connection, Ike played a prominent role in mobilizing the support of local party officials for measures that returned to practice 
of war communism, closing markets, mass arrests of speculators, and brutal requisitions and confiscants, confiscations. It was in the Western it was in Western Siberia in January and February 1928 that the NEP really came to an end. Robert Icke's energetic action on this occasion got him promoted the following year to head of the official chiefly respond to head of the to the headship of the party's regional organization. In this post, he was official chiefly responsible he was the official chiefly responsible for forced collectivization and dekulakization of Siberia. Dekulakization was especially extensive in this region because there were the kulaks constituted a particularly dynamic group, larger than its most other Soviet regions. Within the local peasantry, The ensuing agricultural crisis corresponded to the massive repression that struck 100,000 Siberian peasants, families summarily deprived of their land. 60% of them were deported from the rich, richest agricultural districts in southern Siberia in the Altai area to the Narem region. More generally, the crisis resulted from the profound disruption of the whole mode of production, aggravated by totally disproportionate levels of the name of the state procurements and by two years of drought. According to official figures, Siberian livestock herds decreased by two-thirds over three years, while the grain harvest decreased by 45 percent. However, the procurement plants increased by more than 30 percent over this period. In spring 1931, the Ogpu's secret reports sent to the party's regional leadership acknowledged the existence of isolated areas of difficulty with food supplies. This procurement plan for 1931, which was very ambitious, more than 1,400,000 metric tons of grain and 450,000 metric tons of meat, was fulfilled several months late and at the price of a massive slaughter of livestock and a, and a confiscation of part of the seed reserved for the following year's harvest. In some, fo in some 40 agricultural districts in the southern part of western Siberia, the shortages that appeared in 1931 developed in some places into genuine famines during the spring of 1932. Among the many uh, sources documenting the terrible ordeals of the Siberian peasants during these years, we will limit ourselves here to a letter written to Stalin by three communist officials in the Berzakovsky district on March 26, 1932. These officials justifying themselves by suggesting that given the remoteness of the area, the Central Committee is probably not aware of what is happening here. They wrote, Since last November, more than 2,000 families, that is, a fourth of the population of our agricultural district, have sold out and fled in an attempt to escape certain death from hunger. Only the congestion of the railways and the prohibition on selling tickets have allowed us to break the flight of peasants. At the present time, our district does not have any reserves to feed starving Kolkhozians. There follows a long, a long statistical demonstration in which the, the authors of the letters show that sewing plans were completely unrealistic and that the only way out would be to end would be to send emergency food aid that would restore the Kolkhozians' confidence and prove them, prove to them that Soviet power is an automatically popular power. Accompanying the letter was a package containing physicians' physicians's and veterinarians' statements 
that confirmed the rotting carcasses and food stuff substitutes, as well as the wild plants and tubers were being used to feed peasants. The step taken by communist officials in Berezovsky's district, which was severely punished by Ike after he learned about it, brought the Siberian peasants no relief. This plan for obligatory deliveries assigned to Western Siberia for 1932 went beyond that for 1931. Most of the procurements were allocated for the great consuming regions of Europe, Russia, European Russia, and for export. The Siberian cities scarcely benefited from the levies on the local peasants. In April and May 1932, the norms for the urban population's food supply sharply decreased. Leading to shortages in a certain number of cities, particularly Novosibirsk, Tomsk, Kemerovo, and Barnal. By the way, quick note, um, I see there's lots of you on Instagram and not so many on Periscope, just in case the Instagram story like loses connection. Uh, probably safer to be on Periscope as well or other than my Periscope link uh, where this video is streaming live is in my Instagram bio. Yeah, anyway, back to the book. These economic difficulties were accompanied by serious ethnic tensions aroused by the massive influx into Western Siberia of hundreds of thousands of Ka Kazakhs fleeing the famine that was ravaging the bordering parts of the Kazakhstan. Since 1930, Kazakhstan had been drawn, like the rest of the country, into the turmoil of forced collectivization and dekulakization, to which was added a vast plan of sedentarianization. In this area of extensive livestock raising and transhumance, transhumance? Setting up kolkhozis and sovokhozis was in fact also intended to stabilize nomadic and semi-nomadic breeders. At the same time, a broad plan for developing grain production was drawn up the goal of all these measures was to move the Kazakhs from a natural economy to a socialist economy by rooting out clan structures and feudal, feudal and semi-feudal relationships which, according to the Kazakh communist officials, were keeping the Kazakhs, keeping the Kazakh masses in oppression. In reality, here, more than elsewhere, the race to break records of collectivization together with the obligatory deliveries of meat of unprecedented levels totally disrupted the productive cycle. The Kazakh livestock herds, which were the, the largest in the USSR at the end of the 1920s, decreased by more than 85% in three years, leading to a severe impoverishment of the Kazakh population, which lived almost exclusively on livestock raising. In this situation, the nomads saw no way out but to leave. In January 1931, Stalin and Molotov were informed by Soviet consular, consular officials in China that huge numbers of Kazakhs were migrating towards Xinjiang, or Xinjiang, all through 1931, the Kazakh exodus toward western Siberia, Kyrgyz areas, and as far as the Volga increased. The reports sent by the Ogpu's secret police department to the country's leaders emphasized that most of the migrants came without their flocks, totally bereft, in an advance in an advanced state of exhaustion due to malnutrition and were often ill and the bearers of potential epidemics. The arrival of hundreds of thousands of weakened, starving Kazakhs in regions already suffering from serious economic difficulties and even from shortages did not fail to produce many tensions with the local people. 
who were quick to accuse, quick to accuse of the migrants of causing every kind of problem. The Kazakhs were suspected of spreading epidemic diseases, stealing livestock and agricultural products, eating horse carcasses, and even practicing anthro antho anthropophagy. Anthropophagy. I have to look that one up. From the mining towns of Kemerovo and Stalinsk to remote rural areas of the Altai, persistent rumors circulated to the effect that Kazakhs stole Russian children in order to eat them. According to very incomplete police sources, as a result of these rumors, hundreds of Kazakhs were lynched in the mining districts of the Kuzbaz. Hundreds of other migrants suspected of theft were also lynched. This violence reflected ethnic tensions exacerbated by the hunger suffered on both sides and the resurgence of the old peasant practice of impoverished, I improvised judgment, Samol Sud, in which the community influenced inflicted immediate punishment on thieves and on vagabonds suspected of the worst offenses. But it also reflect the police's inability to maintain public order. In February 1932, faced with a deteriorating situation, the regional authorities in Western Siberia decided to send the Kazakhs home. Extensive police roundups were organized especially in cities and train stations along the rail line leading to Turksib, where most of the migrants were concentrated. Tens of thousands of Kazakhs were forced to depart in special rail convoys that unloaded their human freight in the first stations on the other side of the border between, Russia, Feder between the Russian Federation and Kazakhstan. These forced rep repatriations led in turn to tensions between Kazakh and Siberian officials without actually resolving the situation, since many more Kazakhs continued to enter Western, Western Siberia to escape the famine they were then they were expelled from it. For the regional party leadership, these inter-ethnic tensions were only one manifestation of a far larger and more worrisome social disorder that posed a serious threat to the stability of this particularly agitated frontier area. Of all the USSR's regions, a report of the People's Commi Commissariat of Internal Affairs acknowledged Western Siberia was one of those in which the situation from the point of view of maintaining revolutionary order is the most sense, tense, the most tense, with its special settlements in the north and its anarchically anarchy, anarchy growing new industrial cities in the south, together with its contingents proportionally larger here than anywhere else, of people who were marginally, who were marginal, excluded, or outlaws. Western Siberia combined all the social problems. The great Siberian cities, Novosibirsk, Tomsk, Barnul, Novokuznetsky, and Kemerov and Omsk had the highest rates of criminally, criminality in the USSR. The record in this regard was held by Tomsk, which, according to local officials, was totally saturated with criminals and deported elements who fled the places of residence assigned to them. In order to combat criminality and maintain revolutionary order, the authorities had at their disposal police forces that were notoriously inadequate. For example, there are fewer than 40 police officers for Novokunzetsky, a mining city in Kerbas, whose population had risen in three years from 30,000 to 170,000 inhabitants, poorly trained, poorly equipped, underpaid, and corrupt. In 1932, 
the police force for the whole region numbered no more than 2,200 men. State companies, kolkhozis, grain silos, and other strategic sites were generally guarded by more or less regular, hastily recruited militiamen whose ranks were four times more numerous than those of the police. As for the political police, Ogpu, in 1933, they consisted of not quite 2,000 civilian agents, very unequally distributed over the region's approximately 110 districts, two-thirds of which were not served by any rail line. Whereas more 300 agents were working in the headquarters of the plenipotentiary representative for Western Siberia, in Novosibirsk, no more than a dozen agents were assigned to the rural districts, including secretaries and chauffeurs. This very thin network was strengthened by paramilitary detachments whose ranks varied in number on the order of a few thousand men deployed especially along railways, a strategic line of communication, and also the site of all kinds of thefts and trafficking. The Ogpu's other main sector of activity was the struggle against brigandage, a phenomenon that authorities considered particularly worrisome in the early 1930s. A land of colonization, but also a land of exile and forced labor since the 18th century, Siberia had always been a place of refuge for marginal people and outlaws. After 1917, during the years of the Civil War, certain factors had encouraged the emergence of social banditry in this region. A peasant society in complete turmoil subjected by both the Reds and the imperial white military regimes set up in Siberia to onerous requisitions and constant conscription. At the local level, as Eric Hobsbawm has shown in his works on social banditry, unstable power in a context of shifting military fronts and frequent reversals of the situation, widespread poverty and food shortages and famines that kindled millenni millen millenarian expectations provided to a terrain that was particularly favorable to the development of a primitive rebellion during the 1918 and 20 to 22 period siberia was a crucible for all kinds of crime along alongside bands of peasants, sedentaries, defending their territory against requisitions made by both red and white detachments. There were also more heterogeneous roving bands composed of marginals, deserters, outlaws, uprooted people en route to improbable home or destination they had left years before. Superbly described in Boris Pasternak's Dr. Zivago, these groups, sometimes consisting of hundreds of horsemen, ranged with weapons and baggage over distances as long as 800 kilometers before dissolving in immensity of the taiga, or beyond the far east frontier, leading to Harbin, one of the main sites of Russian enemy emigration, main sites of Russian immigration. The end of the Civil War did not put a definite end to this uh, kind of crime. In Siberia, it remained endemic all through the 1920s, especially in the most remote districts where the socially dangerous elements were exiled and put under house arrest. In 1924, 1926, and 1927, Siberia was officially declared a dangerous region because of crime. A special crime-fighting commission was set up under the Ogpu's plenipotentiary representative whose repressive powers were considerably strengthened. The return in 1928 of a policy of requisitions 
that reminded peasants of the time of war communism, and still more, the following year, the forced collectivization of the countryside and decolonization breathed new life into rural crime. Criticizing the return to coercion in the relationships between the state and the peasantry, the writer Mikhail Solokov, in a letter to Stalin dated June 20th, 1929, reminded him that there is no lack of tinder for a new flare-up of crime. As the whole history of Russia has shown, the more of the state ill-treats the peasants, the more they will resort to old reflex of brigandage. By the spring of 1929, rural crime was rising sharply in the vast, poorly controlled spaces of Siberia. According to By the spring of 1929, rural crime was rising sharply in the vast, poorly controlled spaces of Siberia. According to police sources, at the end of the 1929, more than 450 bands of bandits were operating in Siberia. Among those most feared by authorities was the one headed by a certain Kotskin that had been terrorizing the representatives of Soviet power ever since 1927, called the Black Tsar by the peasants. Koshkin, leading several dozen bandits armed with military rifles and grenades, was particularly attacking the Kolkhozis, which he systematically burned. In 1930, the police force listed for the Western Siberia alone 880 such bands, while acknowledging that these represented only the groups we knew about. In an effort to halt the expansion of rural crime and to repress a peasant agitation that was in places beginning to look like genuine insurrection, the borderline between the two phenomena being indistinct, special units of the Ogpu were dispatched to the most troubled districts. In the Barbazink district alone, more than 1,000 insurgent peasants were arrested in March 1930. Of this number, a hundred arbitrarily qualified by the authorities as Kulak criminals were executed. In an assessment of counter-revolutionary activities in 1930, 535 riots and mass demonstrations, 305 terrorist attacks, the regional head of the Ogpu estimated the number of active criminals in his area at more than 12,000. Organization organized in bands of several dozen individuals, the criminals had attacked 130 Kolkhozis, making off with hundreds of horses, an important prize because it gave them great mobility, particularly in comparison with police forces that were lacking both weapons and mounts, pillaged or burned more than 200 storehouses and silos and sacked 65 rural Soviets. Crime remained endemic throughout the following years. In 1931, no less than 40% of the Kolkhozis in Western Siberia were the victims of attacks by criminals or a terrorist act. Arson, the assassination or attempted assassination of Soviet officials, party members, and other activists close to the government. According to the police sources, these criminals were recruited primarily among kulaks, who had evaded arrests and deportation, as well as among the 10, 000, 10, tens of thousands of deportees who had succeeded in escaping, in escaping. These avengers, as they called themselves, entered a very violent criminal group whose will to settle scores with political system that had brutally excluded and marginalized them constituted a motivation at least as strong as the desire for gain or a taste for adventure. Their primary target was local representatives of Soviet power. Kolkhozis and Sovolskis 
cooperative stores, depots for machines and tractors, silos in which state procurements were stored, and they sometimes redistributed the latter to the peasants. One of the factors stimulating this social crime that never lacked for recruits was the belief, very widely shared in these years of great upheavals, that Kolkhozian system was ephemeral. ephemeral. Testimony to this belief is found in the countless rumors regarding the impending dissolution of the Kolkhozis, the imminence of a Japanese invasion, and the regime's inevitable collapse. To illustrate the climate of violence that prevailed in this Soviet Far East in the early 1930s, we will limit ourselves to quoting a passage among many other similar ones drawn from a report submitted by the Ogpu leadership in Western Siberia. On the political situation in the region on August 15, 1931, after having outlined the struggle against insurrectional organizations and groups dismantled since the beginning of 1931, 511 groups with a total of 6,287 members, the highest regional authority of the police of the political police went on. Over the past two or three months, our services have been noted, have noted the hatching of a dozen new bands, 144 members, as well as two major attacks, about 700 participants. The breeding ground for bandits is constituted by kulaks, who have evaded deportation and secondarily by criminal elements. These bands use as bases for their activities the special villages and the most remote hamlets in the distant areas of the southern part of western Siberia that are inaccessible and covered with marshes where the weakness, indeed the total absence, of Soviet power favors the formation of bands that recruit members among escaped kulaks, criminal el elements exiled to these places, special settlers, and all of those who have fled the place assigned them for residence. Nonetheless, these bands are not limited to such wolf lairs in remote areas. They come down into the towns and administrative centers where they take advantage of the excesses and errors of the party's local organizations and Soviets in order to carry on their criminal activities among the local population, particularly by spreading a whole series of, subverge, of subversive rumors. These bands, criminal activities, are farly or, fairly organized in nature. They often benefit from the support of the local population. Operating in the Sedelnikovo district, a band with 24 members, led by a certain Skiratov, killed on July 1st, in the village of Estonsky, the Communist Party member Lydia Omuk. It also fired on Kolkhozians in the village of Kuprinka, burned the house of the president of the Kolkhoz in Bakino, and handed out pamphlets in which it threatened to kill the communists in Komisols. The band recruits among escaped kulaks. Its growth can be explained by the support it enjoys among the local population. Seven individuals serving as liaisons, liaisons age, liaison agents have recently been arrested. The villagers provide the bandits with food and shelter and keep them informed regarding our detachments, movements, our detachments' movements. According to the telegram sent June 12th, by the head of the Ogpu in the district of Chumakovo, a band of escaped kulaks, 70 strong and commanded by a former officer of the army of Kolchak, a certain Kalinin, has established itself in the marshy, in the marshy region of Chmyz, C-H hyphen M-Y-S, Chmyz, on July 7th. On July 7th, 
this band attacked forestry workers in the neighboring Sovkols. On July 9th, it entered the village of Ekine, Akininskoy, Akininskoy, where it released a family of kulaks about to be deported. On July 10, it attacked the president of a rural Soviet and two police officers who were on their way to Akininskoy to investigate the matter. The official was killed, and the two police officers are reported missing. The following day, the band attacked the depot in Solvkols of Krenshenskoy, where it made off with 16 pounds pounds of gunpowder, five rifles, and winter clothing. In the town of Soyo, Soyozini, the band has organized a general mobilization of the adult population against the Soviet power. On July 16th, it attacked our detachment at Kresenskoya, killing three of our men. On July 18th, it once again attacked our detachment, which is 150 men strong in Dubrovskoya, but having been repulsed, it retreated. On July 19, we occupied, after fighting, Mosin Ovstrov. In the course of subsequent battles, the band has lost more than 60 men, killed, 12 wounded, and 115 have been taken prisoner. In addition, after the band was liquidated, we arrested 130 li- liaison agents and other bandits. The social, dis- the social distribution of the individuals arrested is as follows. 75 kulaks, 115 middle peasants, all of them special settlers, 37 poor peasants, 10 officials, 2 artisans, and 6 individuals whose occupations remain undetermined. We have seized 91 firearms and 16 horses. The veritable guerrilla warfare described in this report was only the most spectacular aspect of a much larger problem that had confronted the party's regional authorities since 1930 to 31. The management of a contingent of 300 to 4,000 special settlers. <clears throat> The management of a contingent of 300 to 400,000 uh, special settlers constituted almost exclusively of dekulakized peasants, almost a third of which had already escaped. In October 1931, Robert Icke, assessing the results of the dekulakization program before an assembly of the party's high regional officers, stated that he knew of not a single domain in which the disconnect between the center and local authorities had been and remained as great as in the case of special settlers. The center had always been prompt to manipulate statistics, elaborate grandiose development plans, and talk about self-sufficiency and food supplies. But the funding to do these things never followed. As for local leaders, they had to settle masses of people in the taiga in record time and without adequate means, and they prevent them from escaping, and then prevent them from escaping. Since the beginning of 1930, Western Siberia had been called upon to play an important role in, this, this en- in the enterprise of liquidating kulaks as a class in the course of which, in the USSR as a whole, four million peasants were deprived of their property and 1,800,000 were deported, 550,000 in 1930 and 1,250,000 in 1931. Western Siberia was in fact not only a region where rich peasants were more numerous than elsewhere, 
They were estimated to constitute about 7% of the region's total population, or about 100,000 families, but also a region of colonization that had vast virgin areas that could accept the de Kulakai's deportees from other regions. In 1930-31, there were two great waves of de Kulakization and deportations, making Western Siberia the region with the nation's highest relative concentration of special settlers. The first of these waves took place in Siberia, as in the rest of the country, between February and May 1930, the quotas of Siberian kulaks to be expropriated and deported to the southern part of Siberia were among the highest in the country. 30,000 families, or a fifth of the total number of families to be deported in the whole of the USSR during the first phase. In addition, Western Siberia was expected to accept 30,000 families of dekulakized persons from other regions. As was the case everywhere, the first wave of dekulakization was marked by countless excesses and, dev and deviations committed by the local dekulakization committees, constituted of local communist activists, labor union members, and workers sent from the cities, and poor peasants for whom the liquidation of the kulaks as a class was first of all an opportunity for unlimited pillaging and for settling old scores. The total expropriation of numerous kulaks raised serious problems for properly carrying out the operations of deportation. In fact, the dekulakized persons were expected to bring with them food, supplies, adequate for at least two months, along with the minimum in tools and materials required to settle themselves in the region, and even to provide by furnishing one horse per family for their own transportation from the point where the rail convoy set them down to the place of residence assigned to them. In reality, as the party official responsible for the Tomsk region wrote to Ike on March 7, 1930, the horses assigned to the convoys are absolutely unsuited for travel over distances of 300 kilometers and more, because when the convoys were formed, all the good horses belonging to the deportees were replaced by nags. In view of the situation, it will be difficult to transport the belongings and supplies to which the kulaks are entitled, according to the, regula the regulations. That is, for each family, a total of seven pounds of flour, 13 pounds of seed, 70 pounds of hay, one plow to be shared by three families, one harrow to be shared by four families, one fork, two shovels, two axes, three scythes, one sleigh, one harness, one saw, two sickles, one large two-man handsaw to be shared by five families. For the transportation of bread and hay alone, we would have to mobilize in connection with obligatory public labor owned by the peasants 20,000 wagons, and this would seriously compromise the spring sowing and woodcutting plans for the whole region. Thus, it was usually, with very few provisions and hardly any tools, the deportees were settled in the places assigned to them. How were these places chosen, and by whom? During the first phase of dequalification, the choice of places and deportation was the responsibility of hastily set up district commissions composed of officials drawn from the most diverse administrations, the executive committees of Soviets. Regrouping committees under the People's Commissariat for Agriculture, regrouping committees under the People's Commissariat for Agriculture, the representatives of the large state forestry complexes responsible for making use of deported manpower and Ogpu directors. 
How could the repressive imperatives emphasized by the Ogpu, which insisted that the deportees be settled in zones whose very nature would make them, would make escape impossible, marshes and impenetrable forests that have no roads and are at least several hundred kilometers from any rail line, be reconciled with the economic imperatives of a productive colonization that was supposed to guarantee the development of the region's natural resources. These incompatible demands generally led to apparent choices. The Ogpu, which was responsible for escorting the deportees, usually having the last word. I think the Instagram thing failed like I had anticipated. So I'm going to pause just for a quick second. My one periscopy. If you can just be patient. But yeah, basically so far, just a little bit of my own input here. This seems like, in summary, the, uh, the government of Russia decided that these farmers would be more suitable to uh, to carry out a collectivized governmental plan if they were all rounded up, marched into the middle of nowhere with barely any supplies. Uh, but um, in fact, when the government started micromanaging them, the production level uh, crashed by 85%. So that's interesting. Anyway, I'm going to go ahead and get back to it. Thank you for being patient. Um, thus, it was decided to give a single example to assign 11,600 deportees to the Kulak district, 1,400 kilometers away from Tomsk with hardly 1,500 inhabitants, accessible from May to October by river, but in winter only by rough trails. According to the report of the commission sent to inquire into the economic use of deporta deportees of the Kulakaisa Kamandantura. 2,700 deportees never arrived at their appointed destination. How many of them died during the 40 days of travel by sleigh? How many escaped? On arrival at their destination in early April 8, in early April, 8,891 deportees were recorded by the 45 officials and guards specifically, specially recruited and assigned to the Kulakaisa Commandantura and an, an administrative entity created especially to manage special settlers. Three months later, only 1,607 remained on the site. According to the Commission of Inquiry, 6,682 deportees had escaped, 80 had died, and 208 had been authorized to return home. On, of the 2,254 horses that had transported the deportees and the provisions they had been allowed to take with them, there remained only 333. The escaped dekulakized persons having left on horseback. The commission acknowledged that when the spring thaw came, the places of settlement chosen at random in the middle of winter had proven to be completely uninhabitable. The rough shelters constructed by deportees themselves had been submerged. The soil would not be cultivated. 
the Commission of Inquiry concluded that the only thing left to do was to transfer the survivors to places more suitable for colonization. This case was not by any means exceptional. Far from it. The number of deportees who died during the first months of settlement, as reported in this document, even appears small in relation to other data collected here and by their officials locally. 200 dead, almost, exclusive ch almost exclusively children, out of a contingent of 1,200 families. 180 young children dead as a result of an epidemic of scarlet fever in diphtheria, diphtheria in a group of deportees consisting of 350 families. The almost complete disorganization, the lack of preparation of the places of settlement, the total absence of coordination among the operations of deportation carried out by the Ogpu, and the settlement of deportees by overwhelmed local officials without resources. All these categorized the first wave of deportations during the winter and spring of 1930. This, no doubt, explains why the initial plan for deporting Siberian Kulaks, 30,000 families, was far from realized. Although almost 70,000 peasant families were expropriated the regional authorities succeeded in deporting, given the deplorable condition of the roads, the lack of means of transportation, and general disorganization no more than 16,000 families, or about 83,000 persons, among whom there were more than 38,000 children and adolescents. As for the 30,000 families of Kulaks from Ukraine, the North Caucasus and the Volga regions that were supposed to be settled in western Siberia during 1930, hardly a third of them were taken to their assigned places of residence, the rest being settled in the Urals. The losses correspond to the ambient chaos. In June 1930, 54,200 deportees had been settled in Narim area. In October, there remained only 22,000. 22, According to police sources, about 22,000 deportees had escaped. About 10,000, 18% had died, decimated by epidemics, especially malaria, exhaustion, hunger, and not counting escapees who disappeared forever in the immensity of the taiga. The taiga is a giant, like, forest of ice, basically. Uh, for Western Siberia as a whole, the immensity of the taiga... Oh, that, for Western Siberia as a whole, the Ogpu listed in December 1930, 100,762 special settlers, more than 42,000, were thus missing. The authorities seemed particularly concerned by the fact that only small minority of the de deportees were engaged in productive labor corresponding to some degree to the claimed objectives of colonizing and developing the region's natural resources. Hardly more than 4,000 deportees were working for the Sibyl, for the Sibyl Trust's forestry complex. 3,200 for the Soyuzolotobo, Soyuza, Soyuzoloto, sounds Japanese, Coal, gold prospecting complex, and about 2,300 working on construction of the great Kuznetskotroy metallurgical complex. The vast majority of the other deportees were trying to survive by clearing a few small tracts of land and struggling to construct rudimentary shelters. Ultimately, the whole operation proved extremely expensive for the state. For all that, however, none of the plans for settlement, the construction of huts, or resource development had been realized. 
the sums made available to the regional administration for the purpose of settling deportees in western Siberia, a million and a half rubles, were read in an assessment report on the deportation of Kulaks in 1930, have been spent recklessly and no one knows where this money went. That's the quote. Supplies are not properly assured anywhere and difficulty in feeding people is developing, in some places into genuine famines. We should note that the 1,000 rubles allocated for each deported family, expenditures for transportation, management, and food supplies, no matter how minimal, was far greater than the average value of the expropriated goods which were evaluated about 5,600 rubles. Wow. Moreover, only a small part of these goods had been actually transferred to the Kolkhozis once the dekulakization brigades had taken their share. These considerations did not slow the pursuit of the great project of collectivization and the liquidation of the Kulaks as a class, undertaken in early 1930. Gathering in December 1930, the plenum of the Central Committee once again ratified the leap forward proposed by Stalin by establishing very ambitious goals for collectivization. Within one year, up to 80% of the farms were to be collectivized in the main gain-producing regions. And by calling for the complete dekulakization in an attempt to remedy the frightful waste of labor and the disorder in making use of special settlers, the Politburo in March 1931, just before launching the second great wave of dekulakization, a special commission led by Andre Andreev, the vice president of the Council of People's Commissars, which was charged with supervising the whole of the deportation operations and setting up a rational and effective system of management of special settlers. This commission, in which Heinrich, Re Heinrich, Heinrich Iagoda played a key role, considerably strengthened the Ogpu's prerogatives. Whereas, up to that point, the political police had been responsible solely for arresting, for arresting and transferring deportees, it was henceforth expected to organize this, their settlement and economic exploitation which was regulated by specific contracts between the Ogpu and a certain number of large complexes assigned to develop natural resources and build infrastructures in the northern and eastern parts of the country. In addition, the Ogpu was given a monopoly on the, administration, on the administrative, financial, and economic management of the special villages that had previously been the responsibility of the local authorities. For this purpose, a head officer for special settlements under the head office of the camps, Gulag, was created. And at the regional level, in connection with the Ogpu's plenipotentiary representatives, departments of special commandanturas led by Czechist commanders charged with administer administering the special labor villages. The concentration of operations in the hands of a veritable parallel administration that permitted the Ogpu to benefit from a sort of extraterritorial extraterritoriality and to gain complete control over immense territories where deportees consisted most constituted most of the local population was supposed to provide a remedy for the chaos and disorganization that had comprised the objectives of the first wave of dekulakization. The second strike, as Iagota called it, was discussed by the Politburo on February 20th, 1931. The objectives adopted at this meeting were particularly ambitious to deport within the following six months and in the country as a whole, between 200,000 and 300,000 families, or about one to one and one half million people, 
And let us recall that in 1930, a total of about 550,000 peasants had already been deported. The Ogpu's regional offices were expected to submit within one month their proposals to Andreev Commission, to the Andreev Commission, which was responsible for coordinating the operation as a whole. On March 18, 1931, this commission discussed and approved a plan for the deportation of 40,000 Siberian Kulak families that had been prepared by the office of the Ogpu's plenipotentiary representative in Western Siberia, which was led by Leonid Zakovsky. The operation, the operations were supposed to begin on May 10th. In the meantime, the Ogpu, Ogpu's local apparatus were expected to carefully organize all the stages in the deportation and the settlement of the dekulakized people. That is, they were to see it, they were to see to it that the deportees had a minimal number of agricultural instruments, draft animals, one horse per family, and other production tools, hammers, shovels, forks, saws, as well as a minimum number of personal effects and food supplies for two months. They were also to set up an efficient transportation system by making use of wagons in the framework of the obligatory public labor owned by Kolkosis and barges for moving the deportees by river, and to locate, in the context of field expeditions, places of settlement, taking into account any studies that may have been made in the 1920s by the Siberian Department of Migrations. Three million rubles were immediately allocated for these operations. At the end of April, Zakowski, the Ogpu's top regional official, submitted his report on the modalities of settlement of 40,000 Siberian Kulak families, a veritable masterpiece of bureaucratic planning. According to Zakowski, all eventualities had been foreseen in order to avoid the disorder that had characterized the preceding year's deportations. Preparations included the requisition of 33,000 350 wagons, in addition to 20,000 wagons provided by the dekulakized persons themselves to transport the deportees as far as the points were, as far as the points where they would be transferred, as far as the points where they would be transferred to river boats. 450 police officers, 518 Kokosian activists, and 1,915 Ogpu agents and guards mobilized to escort the deportation or the deportees. Deportees. The deportation sites had all been inspected and judged suitable for colonization. The second wave in the deportation of the Kulaks of Western Siberia began on May 10th, 1931 and continued until the end of August. This time, the plan's goals were not only met, but were even surpassed. Almost 44,000 families, 182,000 individuals, were in fact deported to the Narim region. Apparently, the Ogpu, as the sole project manager, was able to handle things more effectively. However, we should not conclude that this immense deportation took place without excesses, deviations, or disorders. As Zakovsky wrote to Moscow, between 1,500 and 2,000 persons, chiefly young children, died during the transfers, which frequently lasted between one or two months. The reports submitted by missions carried out in the field by Ivan Dolguik, a 32-year-old Czechist who had been promoted to run the Regional Department of Special Settlements, describes problems just like those that had arisen during the first wave of deportations in the 1930. 
Most districts completely ignored the directives concerning the deportees' equipment and supplies so that the deportees arrived in a state of advanced exhaustion. No fodder was provi provided for the horses so that a quarter of the animals died on the way. The barges are too wide to navigate the Chaya and Parable rivers beyond their confidence, beyond their confluence with the Ob, so that it was necess that it was ne necessary to disembark thirty-eight thousand persons at Baranovo and twenty-five thousand at Parabel, and wait two weeks before more suitable boats could take them upstream. The very rough directions for finding the settlement sites almost never correspond to the reality in the area. Hardly 50% of the sites selected for the settlement of the deportees were able to be colonized. In other cases, it was necessary to improvise and disembark elements in the wilderness. A wilderness described in these terms, the whole basin of the Vasayugan River is an immense marshy plain cut by occasional narrow bands of earth, one or two kilometers wide and five to 15 kilometers long, and covered with an impenetrable tangle of brush. No area can be cultivated without first clearing it. As for the rare meadows, they are underwater until mid-July. However, such concrete realistic remarks in field reports written during the operations of deportation totally disappeared in the triumphal assessment Dolgoik made a few months later, at the end of 1931. Like the whole of the Agpu's regional leadership, he had been overcome by a veritable colonizing euphoria. The colonization operations in Naram region began on May 10th, and were successfully completed on June 30th, 1931. We succeeded in settling in Narim region, which was previously populated by only 119,942 inhabitants spread over an immense territory of 343,984 3, square kilometers. 43,852 families, or 182,327 individuals, and we did so despite great difficulties. Thus, in 65 to 70 days, the Narim region, which the Tsarist regime had sought in vain to colonize for 350 years, succeeding in settling over all that time hardly 40,000 families, has seen its population more than double the settlement of more than 180,000 colonists radically modifies all the economic conditions in the region and opens up extraordinary prospects for its future development. On the basis of such triumphal assessments, in late 1931, a vast prospective plan for the development of the Narim region over the next two years was drawn up and approved at the highest level in Moscow by the Council of People's Commissars. Within two years, the region was supposed to attain self-sufficiency in food production, following the clearing and cultivation of more than 110,000 hectares. The state would invest more than 12.7 million rubles in developing the region. In return, the special villages would deliver to the state, starting in 1932, 2.3 million cubic meters of wood, 5,000 metric tons of fish, and craft products worth 16 million rubles. From the countless assessments drawn up in the course of 1932 regarding the implementation of this utopian plan emerges the picture of a predictable economic and demographic catastrophe. Ogpu officials themselves recognize that because of the complete disorder in the organization and management of labor, the work accomplished by an adult deportee never allows him to earn enough to receive the prescribed food ration. Called payok, 
this monthly ration was theoretically, that is, when supplies had been brought in on time and in the prescribed quantity, which was far from being the usual case, nine kilos of flour for an adult worker plus six kilos per dependent. Six kilos of semolina, six kilos of semolina pr plus three kilos per dependent. One and one half kilos of dried fish plus half that amount per dependent and 800 grams of sugar plus 360 grams per dependent. In addition, every four months, each adult worker was supposed to receive 50 grams of ersatz tea. Other foods such as meat, dairy products, and vegetables, which the deportees were expected to produce themselves in the context of the Food Self-Sufficiency Plan, a halt to the importation of grains and flour into the new colonized territories was even planned for the end of 1933, were totally absent from the slim assortment composing the Pylk. According to the information provided by our commandanta, commandanturas, wrote the head of the Siblog to Robert Ike on July 18, 1932. It can be said that the special settlers employed by the Zapsibila Trust, the largest regional forest products company, are literally starving. In the Commandanturas of Parabelskaya, Mogachinskaya, and Alexandrovskaya, the special settlers are living on roots, bark, and grass, which leads to poisoning and high mortality rates. In addition, the failure to distribute food supplies leads to incidents. The pillaging of storage areas completely disrupts production and encourages those who can still escape to do so. The housing norms are never respected. On average, the living space per person in the huts is no more than 1.5 to 2 square meters. This overcrowding is further aggravated by the deplorable state of health care. There are no medicines at all. In the Novo Kuskaya Commandantura, about 50% of the special settlers have malaria. Infectious patients are not isolated. The administration refuses to provide horses to transport the sick to the nearest dispensary, which is several dozen kilometers away. The sick and all those who can no longer work receive no food rations. The reports submitted by the rare inspectors sent out by the health authorities are still more precise regarding the famine that since 1932 had been decimating the deportees in the pioneering polygon that the Narim region was supposed to be. Flour, the only product that is brought in more or less regularly, is mixed with various substitutes, particularly dried and finely ground sawdust from tree stumps. The deportees use this mixture to make their bread. Another substitute frequently used, especially in the Parabelskaya and the Mo Mogolchinskaya Commandanturas, is birch bark. We have mentioned that in order to satisfy their hunger as quickly as possible, Special settlers often don't even take the time to bake the bread, eating the diluted flour as it is, as it is mixed with water. It is impossible to care for such weakened organisms in local dispensaries or even in hospitals. Even an appropriate dietic, dietetic, dietetic diet leads to fever spikes reaching 39 to 40 degrees centigrade and at the end of four to six weeks these exhausted patients die of paralysis or their cardiac functions for children the situation is still more critical in the Ketskaya commandantura for example both children 
living in orphanages and those living with their families are extremely thin. The expression on their faces, even though they are only four, five, six, or seven years old, is totally apathetic. These children look like old people. They hardly move and have no desire to play. We tried to distribute as equitably as possible the 2,000 food rations for children we had been allotted. Reading these reports, we understand that uh, the cases or the causes of the terrible mortality rates among the deportees. In one year, April 1931 to April 1932, in the Naram region alone, more than 25,000 people, 11.7%, died. The authorities acknowledged that the great majority of these deaths was due less to infectious diseases and epidemics, which were fairly localized, with the exception of malaria, which is endemic in the marshy expanses of western Siberia, than to the total exhaustion of the organisms resulting from the difficulties of everyday life. The in Sal insalubrity, insalubrity, the insalubrity of the settlement sites, cold and hunger. Children were the chief victims. Of the 14,000 deportees who had died between June and August 1931, Sorry, I'm making sure this phone's got power. There we go. Um, reading these reports, we understand uh, the causes of the terrible mortality rates among deportees. In one year, April 1931 to April 1932, in the Nareem region alone, more than 25,000 people died, 11%. The authorities acknowledged that the great majority of those deaths um, was due less to infectious diseases and epidemics, which are fairly localized, with the exception of malaria, which is endemic in the marshy expanses of western Siberia, than to total exhaustion of the organisms, resulting from the difficulties of everyday life, the insalubrity, insalubrity of the settlement sites, cold, and hunger. Children were the chief victims. Of the 14,000 deportees who died between June and August 1931, precisely during the period corresponding to the deportation and settlement of the dekulakized persons, 76% were less than 12 years old. A report submitted in January 1932 recognized that in Naram region, mortality among children under the age of three was 8 to 12% per month. The situation was the same in the other great regions of deportation, Kazakhstan, the Urals, and the North. During 1932 alone, according to the official statistics of the, Dep the Department of Special Settlements, some 90,000 special settlers died, most of them children. Remarkably, Regional authorities of the party and the Agpu seemed far more concerned about the failure of their grandiose plans for economic development. In 1932, none of the goals set had been more than 5 to 10 percent realized, which made the system of special settlements, as Robert Icke said in June 1932, an enormous burden for the regional economy. Then they were about the terrifying than they were about the terrifying human cost of the deportations. So they're more upset about their failure than the deaths. Um, commenting on the mortality rates, one high official of the Ogpu wrote, considering the extraordinary scope of the project of colonization that has been carried out in a very short time, this level of annual losses should not be considered particularly high, far more worrisome in the eyes of the police officials. 
was the phenomenon of escapes. More than 47,000 escapees in one year, 7,721 of which, according to police statistics, had been caught. A phenomenon that encouraged criminality and more generally what the authorities called social disorder. At the end of 1932, the management, not only on the economic level, but also on the maintenance of order of some 300,000 special settlers remained in view of the very tense situation in Western Siberia, a major unresolved problem confronting the party leadership. We can easily understand Robert Ike's reaction when he learned of the new plan, hastily drawn up in Moscow by the Ogpu's central leadership for deporting a million additional people. And that's the end of chapter two.